Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we have Michael Petrasco uh, with us, who is an avid amateur astronomer, avid, avid amateur uh, astrophotographer. And he's been doing this for quite a while, about four, four decades. He comes to us from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. He is also a member of the Cape Cod Astronomical Society. He's been with that since it was founded in 1985, uh, thanks partial to him. He, is now, he now has a position, or he has had a position at the Blake Planetarium in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Um, probably the, uh, what he's most well known for right now is that he's the uh, managing member and project developer at Insight Observatory. Michael's gonna be talking a lot about the, this observatory and its experience and how new it is and how wonderful it is, uh, how people can access it from around the world and what it's all about and how it's taking uh, amateur astronomy to another level, um, more of a, a remote, remote level with uh, dark skies and uh, uh, in which amateur astronomy in a way can now be done uh, 24 seven. Uh, you don't have to wait until the sky is darkened in your area because there's a remote telescope someplace around the world that's in darkness and is being uh, used right now. And you can join in on that. Uh, so I'd like to turn this over to Michael and he can tell us about the Insight, <coughs> excuse me, the Insight Observatory and what it means to us all, how we can get involved, its benefits and um, how it's really going to impact amateur astronomy. So Michael, uh, could, you, could you go ahead and start in on this, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, John, and the Astronomical League for having me on this uh, talk here about Inside Observatory. And happy 75th anniversary, is it, to the Astronomical League? That's yes, yes, it is. We celebrate that actually on uh, November 15th um, of this year. So it was 1946 was when wow. we were first founded. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, as I said, it's great to be here. Uh, so basically, what is Inside Observatory? Inside Observatory, as it's here on the slide, provides remote telescope services for educational outreach, research, and astrophotography from remote observatories around the world at locations in the dark skies of New Mexico, the Rio Hurtado Valley, Chile, Nurbio, Spain, and Hecos, Namibia in South Africa. On the slide here, the telescopes, these are the three telescopes we designated ATEO, the acronym, Astronomical Telescopes for Educational Outreach. These are the ones we primar primarily use for education projects because we do a lot of education outreach. That's what the whole purpose of Insight Observatory was when it was created. Uh, our first telescope to the left here, the Dream Telescope, is a 16 inch uh, focal length three astrograph reflector imaging telescope. Over here to the top right is a TEO 2A, which is a uh, five inch Williams optics refractor. And then 2B is a Celestron 8 Edge HD planetary scope, a Srikasagrain that we use for primarily just for planets exclusively actually. And it's actually, it's two, called 2A and 2B because it's on the tandem mount. And here was our uh, second affiliate that joined us in our mission of education outreach. Uh, down in the Rio Hurtado uh, Valley in Chile is a hosting place called Deep Sky Chile. And this telescope here, we designate, designated a TEO-3. It's a, a 12 and a half inch focal length 9, F9, Richie Creighton telescope, remote telescope. So we have a little bit of each with the ATEO um, on the ATEO network. But since then, we've also added a few other affiliates, um, which are actually located in Spain and Hecos. Um, they are actually more on the commercial side. We do some educational projects with those telescopes, but it's a third party outfit that um, we tend to not do too much education with it because the we like to keep within a, a two week time window of when we do our projects to make sure our data gets back to the students. Um, I, have and, a quick, I have a quick question for you, Mike. Sure. You're talking about um, the very first telescope there, the, the Dream Dream Scope. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that it had such a very short uh, F ratio. Uh, do, do you happen to have an idea of the field of view that that typically gives? It, it's it's um it's a I think I believe it's like maybe 1.3 arc seconds. Um, and to give you an idea, it almost fits M45, the Seven Sisters, in the field of view. But not quite. It's about like that then. <laughs> yeah, That's it's good. pretty. It's pretty wide, and it, and because it's an f three point seven, it's very fast. 
Yeah. So when we do an image, most of our educational um, images are just 20 minutes of exposure. So it's five luminance, five red, five green, and five blue all combined. Um, so it's not very long, but you'll get good um, results with that because it is so fast. Whereas with the other two telescopes, you know, you have to go a little longer. Yeah. I just wanted to point out too, that when you see, can you see my mouse okay on this? I just want to, does my mouse show? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's there. Because I wanted to be able to point things out. Um, these images of M42, the great Orion Nebula, and M45, the Pleiades, these were both taken on a Teo one here. Uh, we designated a Teo one and they are actually five minutes combined of LRGB and gone through some pretty intense processing. But these are the results you get within such as an ex short exposure on our um, 16 inch dream astrograph. And also before I continue, I just wanted to point out these links. Uh, if you ever want to learn more about Inside Observatory, please visit our website at https colon front slash front slash www.insideobservatory.com. Um, then we have our Arteo portal. Our Arteo portal is pretty much how the users of the telescopes log in. They create a free account, log in, and they could request their image data. Please feel free to sign up for one of these accounts because they are free and you know, feel free just to browse through the actual portal and you'll see all of the features and how to take an image if you ever wish to do so. And then I can always be reached or any of us here at Inside Observatory at our generic email address of info at insideobservatory.com. Any questions you have, anything you'd like to see um, that perhaps you could do on our telescope network, just feel free to email me there. So here's the actual services provided by Inside Observatory. Um, the Astronomical Telescopes for Educational Outreach, IATEO, which I just briefly discussed in the first slide, and all the telescopes are accessed via the IATEO portal that I mentioned on the previous slide. So that's how clients, individual users would want to log in, gather um, image data for their astrophotography processing for whether it's a hobby um, or it's educational use, you're using it for research, college students using it for research, or just classroom use as well. Um, then we have what's called the Starbase image set subscriptions. When we first started our portal, we realized there were some people that just wanted to download data to process. They weren't interested in actually using the telescopes. They just wanted to process data from it. So we came up with a, a concept of Starbase and through the ATEO portal, you can see our library of raw images, calibrated images uh, that can be subscribed to and downloaded for, for um, anyone to process. Then the personal image request, the PIR application, that's what we use for beginners wanting to try out our um, telescope network, uh, get, getting short exposures, getting an idea of what kind of data they can get from it. Uh, it's not in the portal, it's actually a separate uh, website. And um, I will send that link out. I should, put, I should, should probably put it in here, but uh, the personal image request is a separate website that brings you right to it. You don't have to create an account. You actually just choose a telescope, uh, the exposure time and the object, and then submit it. And there's a small fee that goes with that. And again, all of, um, all of the fees that are affiliated with the using remote telescopes pretty much goes towards the educational outreach efforts that we have. That's why we have a commercial side that actually keeps funding the telescopes to keep them operational and the portal and you know, our maintenance and so on, the hosting. Uh, then there's uh, an application called the Educational Image Request, the EIR. This is the application we designed and came up with for use in the classroom. It can be used on iPads, uh, Chromebooks, uh, smartphones. And this is where a whole class can take an iPad cart and actually get into the application, request image data, 
for a project that they're doing within their classroom. So we are basically that EIR, the educational image request, is a conduit between the classroom and the remote telescopes. Uh, my, Michael, I, I'm looking at the pictures here and uh, at the students there. Yeah. Um, what, what would be the age range of a, of a lot of these uh, classes? Uh, you know, I'm thinking high school, but I thought now, you know, element, even down to elementary school, that they could benefit from some, something like this for a special activity. Um, yes, we actually, we have done grades five through 12. Okay. Yeah, and we found that the, the fifth graders, they have so much fun doing this type of project because it sort of opens their eyes to, you know, a whole new thing of doing astronomy. Instead of, I had a, a teacher actually say to me one time that rather than them just going on the internet and downloading pictures from the internet of objects, they could take some ownership to it because they can actually submit the request into the queue themselves. And well, if, if, somebody, it. if somebody submits a request, about how long would it take to get her? To get we a like, it's your, with classrooms, we mm -hmm. usually, like to do within a two week window. So we'll start taking the image request. Um, let me go back a little bit. What I'd like to do is I, I schedule an appointment online with the teacher and I do like a, a 10 to 15 minute training. It's very quick on how to use the educational image request application. And then um, I show her how all the image data is going to be accessed by the student. And we like to do that around the full moon because that gives the class time to get them all in and then by the time we get them up to the queue it's last quarter and then we image and we try to do it within two two and a half weeks but we've actually had a case where we didn't do it during take the request during the new moon but during the um i'm sorry we did it during the new moon not the full moon and we were able to get them back within four days um 25 images and that was because of weather cooperated and we had time the telescope queue in the early days wasn't as as busy it is now yeah and these images can be taken from um southern hemisphere as well as, as northern hemisphere objects exactly a tao 3 a tao 3 um which is the richie cretan at deep sky chile um this here the uh tarantula nebula was actually taken from the telescope down there and, um, and, and this one was taken of uh, the Triffid Nebula from the our telescope, our affiliate telescope called AFIL-3 in Hecos, Namibia. It, Namibia. it is a 20-inch uh, IDK uh, telescope. And I just wanted to point out that all of um, all the images you're going to see throughout this presentation were imaged by our telescope network, um, every single one of them. So. Uh, we have M78 here in Orion, M17, the Omega Nebula, um, and then we have a, a partial of the Heart Nebula in Cassiopeia, I believe, like I said, the Tarantula and the Triffid Nebula. Uh, and one last thing we'll, we do, uh, we don't do as much of this, but we'll help plan and facilitate a research project in the field of astronomy with a teacher or a college student if they need help with that. But what we have found that when we show them the EIR, the Educational Image Request Program that we offer, that as long as they know how to do that part of it, they actually create the, the curriculum and apply it to the image data that they receive from Inside Observatory. Now, one of the uh, applications that I like to use, and I was going to recommend anybody who wants to pick out images to image on a remote telescope network is Stellarium because it's free. Um, you can get the Stellarium online web app, uh, Stellarium download, uh, which I like to use on my, my Mac. And then uh, you can actually get the, the mobile version, but I think that's a paid version, I believe, the mobile plus. But um, you can go in your browser to the web app or download it or do it on your mobile. I've been using Stellarium probably ever since it came out. So um, I was just gonna open up Stellarium for a moment here. If I can do that, let's see. There we go. 
And I actually have it set right here um, to SkyPi Remote Observatory. That's where our Ateo 1 16 inch astrograph is hosted in Pike Town, New Mexico. It's uh, about 75, I'm sorry, 7,800 feet above sea level there. And this is what time would pretty much be there um, a little after uh, nine o'clock tonight. So the reason why I like this program so much is the ease of use and just zooming in and you can, it shows you all the deep sky objects that are out there. And I can set less or more. So what I'll do is I'll load it up like this, close it and look around in the, in the different constellations of what's up there. What can we image on the telescopes, on the remote telescopes? So the students um, that do the classroom projects with us, I'll recommend them looking for an object to image. It's like, what do I image? Like, uh, I don't know what to image. So we bring them, the, the teacher will bring them here and it gives them a, you know, it's an online planetarium or download and they can pick their object. Um, another resource too is Telescopius, which we are linked to, which will tell them recommended objects that they can image. But springtime is my favorite personally, because as you can see, all the galaxies that are up there. And I'm gonna to be touching on some of those galaxies um, in the rest of the presentation that you can see. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go through a hand, like about five constellations with some deep sky objects in them. Now the following deep sky objects that I'm gonna show in these constellations that you can find in Stellarium are bright enough to be observed with backyard telescopes. So you don't have to use a remote telescope to see these objects. But if you do, you'll get a lot more detail out of them. So we'll start with Messier 44, the beehive, open cluster in Cancer the Crab. This image of it was taken by a student using the education image request application on a Teo one. I believe it was a fifth grade student. And these are again, short exposures, but you can see that the nice color brings out the red, blue stars. But Cancer, the, these are clips that I have on here are actually from Stellarium of uh, screen captures of the constellation. You can see it's not an exciting constellation, but it's got that beautiful open cluster in it. And then of course there's Leo the lion that's up there. And here's an image of NGC 2903 taken on a tear one, the 16 inch in monochrome. And this is just one five minute exposure. And that can be found up here near the sickle of Leo. And then also in Leo, we have the Leo triplet or the Leo trio galaxies in Leo. Um, this set was actually a three hour exposure by one of our uh, users, avid users that uses our Ateo one telescope often. And so you have M66 here and M65 and NGC 3628, also known as the hamburger galaxy. But you can get some really good color in processing and of course, some of these images that were processed, we were done by award-winning processors who have been at it for a while because it is a learning curve to process image data. I'm still not even close to this one. Uh, th this, this one was done by one of our um, consultants that we use for image processing. But this, these, this trio right here can be found right down here at the bottom of Leo. It shows up in Stellarium. And then we have, we're gonna go on to the Bull of the Big Dipper um, in Stellarium. And we have Messier 108 Galaxy and M97, the Owl Nebula in the Big Dipper. And this is roughly like an hour and a half exposure with image data. And you can see the galaxy right up. So get, this gives you an idea of the field of view. If you looked at these two through the telescope and wide field eyepiece, we were able to capture both of these in one. And, uh, this image was requested uh, just for M97, and that's why that's centered, and, and M108 is more up near the uh, edge of the field. But we can actually take, get both of these and center them. Because in our application, you can 
actually type in custom coordinates. So you can actually have the scope centered on a certain area of the sky of your choice. And those objects, of course, are near Mirac in the bottom of the bottom point of star there in the Big, Dip, Big Dipper, M108, and M97, the Owl Nebula. And here's one of my favorites, M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy. This was done with roughly five hours of data from Mateo 1. And of course, that's located up above the handle of the Dipper. But uh, people, one thing I want to mention too is when people are trying out the telescopes, they experiment with the image data too. So you might just use a luminance filter and a green, red, and blue, but we have a hydrogen alpha filter on there too. This galaxy does not have it. We only image this with LRGB per a, a client's request. But if we added H alpha, I did an alpha filter to a data, this galaxy would you'd get more detail out here to become more, more, more precise. But this is pretty good for LRGB, just the, the four filters. And here's M81 and M82. Um, Bode's uh, galaxy right there, M81 and M82, um, the Cigar Galaxy. And they're located up above Ursa Major right here. And how I find these with a backyard telescope is I'll take these two stars of the Bowl of the Dipper and make my own pointer here about equal distance. And it's an easy way to find them. And they're pretty bright. Um, I've seen them through a high powered astronomy binoculars as well. But this, um, this image data is about 20 hours. And here's the, the flux that, of dust that's going all through here. It's pretty popular. Um, but this image processor, this is on Starbase, actually. So anyone can go on and download it and uh, process it and post it wherever. In this one, uh, we're gonna move on to Virgo here, the constellation of Virgo, and we have the Sombrero Galaxy uh, between, I like to find it going a little bit to the right from Spica and a little bit 11 o'clock from Corvus here. And uh, that's how I usually find it. But this image here, this is a star-based image set that's now in progress that we're creating. If you look at it, the colors aren't quite, looks a little off and that's because we don't have any green filtered. This is just luminance, red and blue right now. But I wanted to, to show it just to give an idea of the detail that it will show in the image data of the galaxy. In our last constellation here, we're gonna go to Bodies uh, with this bright star Arcturus and M3, the globular cluster. This is one of my favorites, probably it's up there with M13, the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules, and M15 in Pegasus. But uh, this one was actually imaged by a fifth grade student using the EIR application. And again, it's um, LRGB, five minutes each filter. And, uh, and you can see why they get excited when they get these, because there's more information in there. There's more detail than they expected. But what they also like to do is they come back to us saying, oh, thank you for the cluster image, but we found this little galaxy here. So what they like to do is they like to zoom in and just pan around and see what else they can find. Uh, again, I want to thank the Astronomical League for having me do this presentation. And here again are the links to contact us and learn more about the site. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity, John, if you have any questions uh, for me, yeah, um, I was interested in knowing, uh, as far as the students that you engage with or, or your customers, how many of them are non-English speakers? A lot. Um, we are we have users that are global, um, but yeah. we I usually type with them, like I communicate with email or, or messenger or WhatsApp, so we can communicate well because they actually they can type English very well. Um, so I communicate most of them just with via email, but we have users from uh, Brazil, Chile, India, France, Australia, pretty much 
pretty much everywhere because our portal can be accessed online from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fantastic. That so this is a yes. worldwide thing uh, that anybody can can, can access uh, if they have the computer. Uh, yeah, that's good to know because I, I know that there are a lot of um, Spanish speakers. Uh, who would like access to something like like this and i'm sure the other language yeah is, is we have the google translate right. application that's on our website so our website can be translated right right and i i know about some some of these um places that you have locations that you have the telescopes i know about some of them uh the, the one in Hurtado valley in chile i i happen to have been there as a tourist and that that whole area is extremely dark it's uh, it's not in the extremely high altitudes that, that there are further north in Chile, but it's still a really nice area to, to observe from. So judging from that, I can I guess that you, you're going to have some really great skies at these other telescopes as well. Yes, uh, we found New Mexico is is pretty good. Um, uh, we because we we're looking for for a place for our own telescope, we thought about shipping a Teo one in the beginning to Australia, and mm -hmm. but. There was a lot of cost involved with sending it to another country and to set up for a project like this. So we decided to keep it in the US and go to, and we found this spot, Sky Pi Remote Observatory. It's a gentleman that has four observatories with peers in it, and he rents them out to people doing remote imaging. Right, right. So what, what so in summary of everything here, uh, you have a, a series of telescopes spaced around the world that people can access uh, to image just about anything uh, at any time, day of night, basically. Of course, the moon is going to interfere at some points of the calendar, but uh, I guess you can work around that at least somewhat. And a lot of this is, is accessible for, for schools, uh, college level and lower, all the way down to elementary school, fifth grade, fourth, third, maybe even third, I, I don't know. But uh, it's a great educational outreach opportunity. Um, maybe not even exactly outreach, just educational opportunity. Right. Uh, people can, can join in, uh, do what they want and learn something from it. Uh, and then I'm sure you have other people who like doing this just for the pictures because they, they are uh, very detailed. Yes. Uh, Im imagine what all this brings to people because you, we're now in a spot technologically in which you can see the universe firsthand, almost firsthand, with a lot of detail, a detail that couldn't have been gained 30 years ago, even in professional observatories. You know, you're, you're talking about some of these images are, are just a few minutes, but others are many hours long. Yeah. And boy, they, they really show up quite a bit. I, I know the processing has a lot to do with it, but yes. the, uh, the actual image capture is quite, quite remarkable, quite remarkable. Um, okay, then, um, unless uh, you have something further to say, I, I think we can uh, sign off for now. We will be uh, posting this on YouTube and on the Astronomical League Facebook page. This is all in conjunction with the 75th anniversary of the Astronomical League. We have a series of these talks just to show everyone how amazing, how wide ranging our avocation really is. Uh, this particular one by, uh, um, by Michael gave us a, a good idea on what remote imaging can, can do for us and what's available right now. And I say right now, you know, in five years from now, technology is always advancing. I'm just wondering what's going to be available then fairly yes. well to see. I know, yeah. and Michael's going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hopefully we'll have more telescopes. <laughs> so. I'll, I'll, go. I'll, be, I'll be sunk under technology, though. <laughs> it's always improving, though. But anyway, uh, thank you again, uh, Michael, for, for taking your time to present this. And, My pleasure. Um, we'll be seeing everybody around. Thank you all for tuning in. Mm -hmm.